polling today. Again, my name is Benji Cohen. We're in fish and, fish and wildlife outreach for the Minnesota DNR. And we have a great topic today, the kayak fishing across Minnesota. It's kind of an up and coming sport. And Ron Strauss from the Minnesota Kayak Fishing Association is joining us today to talk a little bit more about how to get into it and some tips and tricks on what to look for when you're out there. So Ron, welcome and thank you for joining us today. I, first off, I want to I want to thank the DNR for giving me this opportunity to share the sport with people, and as, as you can see, that that's me and my fishing kayak. And what we're going to talk about today is why I'm into it, why I think you should be into it, and how to get into it a little bit. Learn about the um, the gear, kayaks, and uh, what makes kayak fishing a little bit different. What you need to know, basically. So. That's me. I'm the president of the Minnesota Kayak Fishing Association. Uh, I've been promoting kayak fishing for over 20 years since it started on the east and Gulf Coast and kind of started working its way through. And that's that's me up at Lake of the Woods. A that's a trip I take every year uh, up to catch northern pike on Lake of the Woods early season. And that's why I'm smiling because I'm having a good time watch or catching uh, some big pike up on Lake of the Woods. So. What are the benefits of kayak fishing and, and why do I think it's unique and special? Well, if you can see the first thing right up there, it's all in big, bold ca caps. To me, it's it's you're, you are down there, you are closer to the action. And if you look at this photo, you'll see that the guy up there in his kayak is right there and that fish is right below him. I mean, the, 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 the close encounters that you have with the water and with the fish you're catching are unique in a kayak. And, some of the experiences I've had being so close to the water and fish as you catch them, or as even as they follow your lures is just unique. And it's it just, one thing I'd like to say is fishing is fun. Kayak fishing is a thrill because it really is. I've had some extreme thrills with big fish up top or very close to me in my kayak where it, looked, it felt like the water was just boiling around me because that fish was thrashing and you're right there. And it's, it's very, up close and the account and the encounters you have, they're they're just they're thrilling. So another thing about kayak fishing that that's unique is that it's very quiet and stealthy. So when you see bass anglers that are doing finesse fishing, they'll get into an area, maybe in some lily pads or something else, and they'll just kind of pick apart the areas around them, then take their paddle and kind of three or four strokes and they're off maybe another 10, 15 yards and they're picking that part of picking the area apart so you can sneak up on fish. So it, it's, it's, it's a very stealthy way to fish. The other thing is, is another thing is that you can get into areas that other power boats can't get into. There's, there's accesses and ways that you can take your kayak and we'll talk about this later is you can put it on a cart wheels and you can kind of like a wagon kind of pull it around and get down into areas. And those are areas that are going to be far less pressure than other areas. So it makes them unique, makes it unique that you can get in here with a kayak and you can just, you can fish waters that other people can't get into. And it's, it's something that kayak anglers are proud of that, you know, there are these areas that we can get to, or we can find these areas and get into them. The other thing that that's attractive about kayak fishing is that if you're a, a, a pier fisherman or a shore fisherman or something, and and you're looking to get out you might see out in there you know there's a rock pile out there but i can't get to it you know or um, there's another area there's some overhanging branches or something or, or that dock or this dock it's it's a low cost way it's it's pretty affordable to get into kayak fishing and get off of shores and that that's where a lot of kayak anglers come from they're they're shore fishermen or pier fishermen and they just they just want to get out there they see these areas and they want to get out there so those are some things that make kayak fishing unique and special. The other thing for me is that these people on this page here, I, I didn't know these people before I got into kayak fishing. And some of them I've known for years. This woman down here, I just met in the last month. And, you know, we've, we've spent a lot of time talking and um, fishing together. We, we did an outing together. So, there's just amazing people that get into kayak fishing and the sport kind of lends itself to, um, you know, what are you doing? How are you fishing? How's, how's your kayak set up? What types of things do you do? Um, so the, the people thing of it has just been amazing. 
tournaments. This this was a, a destination tournament we had, and we have some online tournaments where you can fish anywhere in the five state area, and they're month long, and people just submit fish, and over over the course of a month, um, we we have a winner. Uh, destination tournaments at places. This this one was up on Clearwater Lake. You can see the winners. This 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 guy won a kayak and five hundred dollars. And then we have big big bass pots, kind of like the other ones. But these these are strictly kayaks, so we limited to just kayaks. So um, it, it's a special event just for kayak anglers. This this is really what one of the things that makes it special for me is is that this this was we were fishing. I was fishing with this person. Up on West Rush, and you get together and you 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 launch your boats. You're at the launch. You're chatting. You're talking, and then we started going going out to fish. And eventually, this was a picture of my buddy Tom. And Tom pulled off. And what makes it unique is that it, it, it's the solitude part of it. That eventually Tom left, and I was on my own. And this was we were fishing a tournament. I had seven hours just to myself. To fish, it was just me, the lake, and the fish, and that solitude is is another thing that's very valuable. Kayak anglers are very social, but it's also this solitude thing, where if I'm alone in my kayak, I can say I want to go over and fish over there, and I do. I just I take myself over there, whereas if you're in a boat with another person, it's always the well, where do you want to go? What are you thinking we should do? With kayak angling, uh, it, it's a solitude thing, and I just I can make the decisions, and I just go, just go fish when and where I want on my own. So if we look at kayaks, what are the difference in them? So if you were to classify them, this would be a sea and touring kayak. You can see it's very long, and the if you look at the gray areas here, these are the cockpit areas of these different styles of kayaks. So you can see that this one is very long and narrow through the waist, and this is this is made to cut through water. This this is go fast, go straight. It's not made for big, quick turns or anything like that. So that's that's a sea or a touring kayak. This would be what you see the guys going over the waterfalls with, or going down the the rapids. You know, it's a freestyle. It's a whitewater kayak. It's meant to bang into rocks, bang. You know, into things. It's very short, very, you can turn, you've seen them flipping, doing all, all, all those types of things. So these, these are fishing kayaks and fishing kayaks were kind of, um, came, came from these two things. And you can see that this style of sit on top fishing kayak, which is very popular, has an extremely wide open deck. So you can do things, bring fish in here. You can carry gear. You can, you can situate it however you want. There's also a sit inside style like this that is, is used for fishing also. You can fish from any of these, but a couple decades ago, these manufacturers started making dedicated fishing kayaks. And that's that's the difference between this style or this style versus an actual fishing kayak is is how they're how they're set up. Another thing that makes fishing kayaks difference is, is there's, we talked about that, the, the, the width of the waist, and they're typically wide because there's an emphasis on stability for fishing kayaks. So you could be fishing for a big pike and you, you want something that's very stable that's not going to tip because you, they're, they're going to be large and it's going to be easier to deal with in a kayak that's stable. Uh, the other thing about fishing kayaks is they're made to be able to mount accessories and gear. So if you look here, there's this big long rail and it's on each side. And you can you can see he's got a water carrier here. He's got a fish finder over here. You can't see it, but they're made to be able to mount gear on. And you're gonna need a lot of gear and we'll talk about that more later, the things you're gonna need. So you're, need to, you're gonna need to bring a lot of things with you. So fishing kayaks have built-in gear mounting features. They're also capable of carrying more weight. Um, you're going to have your tackle. You might have an anchor. Some people might have motors. So fishing kayaks also they're they're going to have just like a boat's going to have is what's the weight carrying capacity, and that's one thing you'll need to consider when you're thinking about what am I going to buy where or what kayak am I going to buy where am I going to fish. The other thing is standability. Um, you can see he's standing up. He's sight fishing. So that's these these are some other things that make 
kayak fishing or kayaks, fishing kayaks different from other kayaks. The, the next question you get into is, is there's different types of propulsion and it all started with paddles, just like this, the double bladed paddle it's called. And then about a couple decades ago, pedal kayaks came out and there's a couple different types of pedal kayaks. One is a fin style flipper, which is similar to how a penguin swims underwater. And the other pedal kayak is more like a bicycle. And another type of propulsion that's get, getting more and more popular these days is electric motor. People are putting trolling motors on there or manufacturers are actually manufacturing kayaks that have uh, an electric motor built in. And just this year at ICAST, they came out with an e-pedal, which is similar to an electric bike. So you pedal it, but it's got an electronic motor assist. So the, the, the amount of innovation that's happened in this industry in the last couple couple of decades has just been incredible. But the, these are the types of propulsion and the paddle fishing kayak is the most basic, it's the most affordable, and it's still the best in, in a lot of situations. Um, if you're going in shallow rivers, streams and shallow, shallow water streams and river, this, this really is best because on a pedal kayak, there's going to be a drive that's below the surface here. You can see there, there's nothing here. He's just, he's just paddling. These, uh, some of the cons are is that if, if he's fishing, if he's trolling here, his hands are busy with a paddle. So, you know, potentially, you know, he's maybe losing a few fish, but this is the most basic, it's the most affordable, and it, it, overwhelmingly, it's the way people get into the sport. Pedal fishing kayaks, this, this is the fin style I was talking about. So these fins go back and forth. It's the same way a penguin swims underwater. The advantages are, you can see Casey here is, um, he's, he's pedaling his kayak, so he's moving, but his hands are on the rod. So he's fishing this whole time. So he's gonna be able to feel strikes easier. The other advantage is that this muscle group, your legs are stronger than your arms. So it also uses a stronger muscle group to propel you. So you go a little faster, a little longer. Um, these can be a little tough to use in shallow water or weeds. This, whether it's this style or whether it's a propeller style, it can be a little more difficult to use in weeds. Talked about motors, they, they, they are growing in popularity. You can get to spots faster, you can fish longer. This is a buddy of mine, Dean, and I, I met him one day out at a bass lake and we were both kind of fishing the same tournament and we talked for a while and, and he said, he, he told me fish docks, Ron. He said, they're under the docks. He said, but I'll be there before you. So he got there way ahead of me. He was able to go further into, further down the lake and he was there faster and he could fish longer. He probably stayed out there for eight or 10 hours. Um, what are the downsides to the, the motors? Like again, shallow waters can be a problem. Um, you're gonna need a big battery. So they're gonna be heavier, a little bit tougher to lug around. But there's the, the point I guess on all this is that they all have upsides and downsides and knowing what those are, are gonna be important as you, you figure out what you want for a kayak. And of course, these, these are dependent on battery power. One thing we tell everybody is get a good seat. Do not, do not get something that you're not going to be comfortable in. By over, overwhelmingly the people that get out of the sport, it's because my kayak's too tippy or I'm sitting in a puddle of water or my back hurts kind of a thing. So we really stress that get a good seat, you know, get something that you're going to be able to enjoy it and stay out there for a while. So now you, you come down to some other questions. What's the best fishing kayak for me? And the first question is, well, what type of water are you gonna be on? Are you gonna be fishing big water? Or are you gonna be fishing small, shallow, bendy streams? Those, that's something you need to consider. And the other thing is, how are you gonna transport this kayak? There's basically, you can put it on top of your car and strap it on. You can put it in the back of your pickup with the tailgate down, or you can get a trailer. Those are the three um ways that you can transport your kayak the other thing to consider is how much weight do you need to bring um you know consider your own weight 
Are you going to add a trolling motor and battery? How much uh, gear do you need? Are you going to use it for camping? You know, if you're going to use it for camping, you're going to have more gear that you're going to need to bring along. So these these are some th basic things that you should consider when you're selecting a kayak. So transportation, you can see this is one of my favorite trails. This is a, a friend of our trailers. This is a friend of mine who took a jet ski trailer, added these ladder racks, had a custom rack built up here, and it's it's he he can back right down to the water and put it in and take it out pretty much like a boat. He's also got a a rod holder here so his rods aren't in in the cab of his truck, and he's got an extra place up here for a second second um, kayak that he can transport. The other way outside of trailering is car topping. So. If you are going to be lugging your kayak on the top of a car, you really want to consider weight because you're going to have to put it up there and take it down. So, you know, you, you probably want to consider something that's possibly a little bit lighter. Um, fishing kayaks can come in anywhere from 10 to 14 feet long in different widths and they have different weights, how much they, how much they uh, weigh just the hull. So if you're going to car top it, you probably want to consider something that's a little lighter. So trailer car topping, and then some people just throw them in the back of their, their pickup here. And, you know, you want a red flag on the back here. And that's another way. So what we talked earlier is once, say he couldn't get down to the lake, how's he gonna get his kayak to the lake? There's these carts and there's a lot of different types and styles of carts. So you put your cart on here and you just grab a handle right here and you can wheel it around. And that's, that's uh, also, a consideration is where can I get my kayak into? So these these carts are a way to get your your kayak from the vehicle to the water and more importantly, get it into waters that maybe just aren't accessible by other people with with boats. PFDs, this you can see both my buddy Mike here and I have this slim line. This this is popular. The there's an inflatable bladder inside here that is is fueled by a air cartridge and you can see down here this has this is a little rip cord so if you were to fall over you'd pull this rip cord and this this would inflate the advantages of these is that they're very comfortable to wear you can see that they're not big and bulky and hot and they're, they're comfortable so there, there's two types one is where you just pull this little rip cord and it inflates and there's a second type that adds a seltzer tablet in here. So if if I were to fall over, there's a seltzer tablet in here that would dissolve, that would initiate that bladder to inflate. So the advantage to the seltzer type, that, that additional, it just adds that if I were to, for some reason, get knocked unconscious, this would automatically inflate versus the one where I have to pull the ripcord. So those are slimline PFDs. In the two different types, I I personally always go with the seltzer type. It's it's just just my preference because it's just one extra layer of safety. These the, the kind of a traditional vest style jacket. They they're you can store a lot of tools right in here, and they have clips on here that you can hang your tools, your players, and other things too. So people like these for that reason. The other advantage is is in the spring or the fall, this is going to add a little warmth. For you, so, so those those are the different types of PFDs that are typically used on kayaks, fishing kayaks. Sunglasses, important stuff as far as I'm concerned. I the most important thing to me is when you're down that close to the water, hooks and different things are flying at you. So you you want sunglasses to protect your eyes from anything that that could impact your eyes. Um. I like to throw top water whopper ploppers and frogs and things like that. And when you miss on a hook set, that's coming right back at you and it's coming back really fast. So sunglasses protect your eyes. They also protect your eyes from the bright lights that are going to be there. You're down real close to the water. The sun's reflecting off of there and, and that that uh, bright light is dangerous for your eyes. So take care of them. And of course, you know, there's a practicality that you'll be able to sight fish. You'll be able to see down below the water because the polarization on the sunglasses. Sunblock and hydration. This this is what I've gone to. I used to let myself get 
tanned and now I've pretty much, I cover myself up completely. Um, this stuff is very lightweight and breathable. I uh, wear quick dry pants. Um, if, if you're not doing that, definitely bring liquid sunscreen and, and keep it out there with you the whole time. And water, just, just bring it with you for hydration. So this, this, the sun is, is, a, is, can be, Damaging, so protect yourself from it. You know, cover yourself up. Bring water for hydration. First aid kit. It's gonna happen. A, a pike's gonna bite you. You're gonna get scraped on a gill plate. Um, something's gonna happen, or you're gonna get a hook, or your friend's gonna get a hook. So have a first aid kit. Bring it with. Hook cutters. Bring it with. Like I say, because you're either gonna you're either gonna hook yourself or your buddy's going to hook himself. So it's going to happen at some point or you're going to you're going to hook a fish deep and it's it's going to come to a point where you might be better just just cutting the hook. So hook cutters these these hooks are stainless steel so they're very hard. So a typical players may not be able to cut the hook so I bring a hook cutters. Other safety stuff is is back here a safety flag. If you can imagine if he's sitting down, his head is up here. So he's very low to the water we talked about. And, and the, the downside to that is, is that other boaters can't see you. So you need to have a whistle and you need to have a whistle to signal other boaters just in case they can't see you. And you also need to have a whistle in case you're, you need help from another uh, kayak angler while you're out. All the things you can get on a power boat now if, if they come available on on kayaks. It's just the industry has just grown. It's grown from DIY stuff to manufacturers making specific stuff. So any of the fish finders that you could get on your, your big power boat, you could get it on um, kayaks. So you you, you, you want to match the, uh, the size of your graph to the size of your battery. Transducer, people used to have to DIY them, but now most fishing kayaks have built-in mounting for fish finders. Your rods, reels, tackles, lures, it's, it's, this stuff is pretty much the same as you would have shore fishing or anything else. Uh, fishing kayaks have, have been manufactured now to handle standard size tackle boxes. So you've got a 3600 or a 3700 box that have been around forever. So there's storage that are built into fishing kayaks. And in mine, down in front of me is a hatch that holds two 3600 uh, size tackle boxes. So they've, they've said, okay, we know what they're going to use this for. Here's the standard style size box. And, and that's what we're going to use. Fishing crates are something that started out in, in as just milk crates. It was just a milk crate that you would put in the back of your kayak and bungee it on. It's just a way to haul stuff and fishing from that. The manufacturers have developed specific fishing crates, and I'll, I'll show you mine in a little bit here, that are made for kayak fishing. The only thing that's kind of somewhat different for me for kayak fishing versus other types of fishing, if I'm going musky fishing on a boat, I'm, I'm grabbing my big eight foot rod, or even if I'm gonna go out on the power boat, I'm gonna grab a seven, six rod. For me, I, I prefer, and this is, I, over time, I've, I've decided that shorter rods are a little easier to handle in my kayak, so I, typically won't go over a seven foot two rod, although you certainly can. Um, it just it just makes it a little easier for me to have a shorter rod and to be able to land these fish. This is what I was talking about, a, fish, a fishing crate. Um, this is storage. So this started out decades ago, it was just somebody said, hey, I'm gonna put a milk crate back here. And that's what they did. They just put a milk crate on there and they stored their stuff like that. And then they, Took a milk crate and they started adding rod holders. This this is a manufactured crate from a, a fishing kayak company. So you can see it's got four built-in vertical rod holders. I've got storage over here. There's storage in here. This holds 3,700 size tackle boxes. So the the whole storage thing it, it's it's been optimized on kayaks. You can bring a lot of stuff. So for me, I've got. Four rods set up. I'm fishing up here with one. If I want to change a tactic, you can see I've got uh, four different tactics set up here. I've got a, a top water. I probably have a Texas rig on here. I've got a frog here. Now this is the Texas rig, and then there's a wacky. So if if uh, I'm, I have one rod up up in the um, 
up where I'm fishing. And then if I just need to, I just reach back and I can change tactics pretty fast. Other other tools you need there. There's lots of other tools you need. So let's talk about nets. I've, I've kind of settled on this kind of medium size. A lot of guys will use smaller handheld nets for bass. Um, if I'm in a tournament, I like the extra length on this just for me. I can get out there and land a bass further out. Uh, when I go up, I was talking, I was up on Lake of the Woods. I have a bigger net than this because I'm, I'm going to be landing 40 inch pike, hopefully. So, uh, you match the size of the net to what you need. These, this is a, a, a buddy. This is, uh, some tools that he has on his boat. And this, this is 1 thing you want you eventually you're going to. You're going to get into a pike that doesn't want to open its mouth, so you're going to need some jaw spreaders, some deep players to get out hooks, and then he uses this for his hook cutters for, you know, whether he hooks himself or he needs to, you know, get it out of a fish. And the way you set these, set these up is, is personalized, too. That's, I've kind of gone to, there's little mini tackle bins where I store all my tools, and they're all on leashes. That's another thing that's big in kayak fishing is leashing everything, because if you if you were to um turtle is what the term is or flip it um you want you want stuff leashed so you don't lose it big thing in kayak fishing is cameras we love to take pictures of each other we love to take pictures of ourselves fishing it's um my youtube channel is where i spend my time in the off season reliving my previous season you know with some of my youtube stuff so and it's most basic thing people taking they'll they'll have their cell phone and it'll be on again on a leash you know, so he could have a clip here and his cell phone's in his pocket here, but it's on a leash. So he can just kind of outstretch his arm and take a picture of himself. There's different types of grips that you can attach to your kayak uh, for for having your, your cell phone out so you can take pictures of uh, yourself with fish. And then there's all sorts of camera mounts. You can see he's got a chest mount here. I, I know he's got a camera out here. Um, so. Cameras and, and mounts eventually, you know, you st a lot of people just start out with the basic. I'll, I'll just have my, my cell phone and take selfies that way. And, um, you can go, you can get more involved with that. There's plenty of people that kayak fishing on YouTube is a big thing. So there's a lot of videographers that, that do YouTube videos. Um, the other, the other considerations for cameras is, is there's, there's specific requirements for photos for tournaments, but that, that's a whole different thing. Anchoring you, you can anchor power boats. You can anchor a kayak very easily. This, this, you know, you just push yourself back into the reeds and you're anchored or you push yourself up on shore and you're anchored. They also use just, just, uh, you could, you could just take basically a, a garden stake. I mean, this is back in the DIY days. People were just taking garden stakes and shoving them through scupper holes or tying them onto the side of the kayak. It's very affordable. It's just, it's just a, a long pole. I think it's a tomato stick. They call it. Other things people were doing early is they'd take exercise dumbbells and they'd cut them in half and they'd put an eye bolt in top and just attach water and throw it over the side. It was uh, just a very affordable, easy way to do it. Uh, you can see on this kayak here, he's got an anchor trolley, which is got these two pulleys at each end and he there's a hook rate or a ring right up in here and he either attaches an anchor to it or it'll attach that stake up pole but he can move it depending whether he wants to be anchored off the bow or the stern and again in the this stuff whatever you can get on the the big boats you can get on the small so this, the kayaks these days so the big bass boats have the big power poles that go down and they'll you know anchor them in into the soft mud you can get power poles for your for your uh kayak fishing kayak so you'd have a power pole back here it'd be battery driven so um again that just adds a little more weight and i used to fish a lot with drift socks and you can get drift socks for kayaks so anything you can get on the power boats the manufacturers have have you know said kayak fishing is enough of a sport that we're going to make it for the for the kayak fishing people this this is one thing that we really really stress is that it's it can be confusing when you start to look at kayaks and look look at this this one's short this one's a little wider this is longer you know what other features are in here so when you start to look at kayaks it can be confusing on what do i need what do i want well 
most local fishing kayak dealers will have try before you buy demos. They they want you to get the right kayak, fishing kayak too. So we really stress is that take the time, just go out and you know talk to talk to the dealers and say, here's what I want to here's the here's the type of fishing I think I want to do. And they'll say, well, here's here's a uh, two or three kayaks. Come on out to the lake and try them out. So, get in there, try them out, and see which one you like. Try out different brands. Try out different models. Don't the don't don't be shy about it because it, this this is the best way to make a confident decision before you purchase your fishing kayak is to just get out there and try them. And like I say, the the local fishing kayak dealers they want you to do that. How do you store it? Well, you're either, it's either going to be in the garage or outside. If it's outside, make sure you you uh, cover it up because you're going to want to protect it from the sun. These these things are uh, a supple plastic. Typically, they're roto molded is is what what the manufacturing process is, and it's a it's a very supple pl plastic. So the sun will collapse them. Uh, you'll get oil canning and dents. So if you, if you're storing it outside, cover it up. Whether it's outside or inside, the manufacturers typically want you to put the hull up. They don't want weight on the hull while it's being stored. Um, inside, you can store it vertically, horizontal, same thing though, but they, it's preferred that you put the hull up. This, this is, once you, once you get your first kayak, the first thing I want you to do is I, I want you to just practice loading it and unloading it. This is this is Jorg, uh, a friend of mine, and he did a YouTube video on how he loads his, and he had these racks, and all he uses is a cam strap here to to make an area where he pivots the kayak up, he gets around back, and he pushes it on top. So before you get to the the lake, practice loading it, unloading it, loading it, unloading it. If you're if you're in a trailer, practice backing it up, you know, loading it. So so you have a good feel for. Um, what it's going to take to get that boat on and off the water. The other thing we, we tell people is don't mount your accessories right away. Um, people can get really excited. I'll, I'll tell you, every year I move my accessories. And, and actually, I was out fishing last Saturday, and I said, why is your phone over there? Your phone should be in the hatch down here. So you, you're going you're gonna to move stuff. So don't start making a bunch of holes in your kayak till you've had enough time to figure out where stuff is going to go. And once once you get that new kayak, get out on the water and don't take any gear with you. Just take your paddle, whatever you need to move around and get out there and just kind of take yourself and tip yourself side to side so you can get a feel for where the tipping point is. And Typically for me, I tell people is if you just stay straight on top of that kayak and just reach, you're you're fine. It's when you start getting too far and you go too far that you're that you're gonna tip. And that's that also goes back to get out and try these kayaks because some are far more stable than other ones. So that will also prevent you from getting something that that you're not comfortable with. The last thing is if if, if it's spring or fall, be be aware of hypothermia, you know, air and water temperature. So learn about it, learn when, you know, it, this isn't a good time to go out, uh, potentially, especially by yourself. Um, and if you're gonna do it, make sure that you have the right safety equipment and change your clothes and things. How are you gonna find the best fishing spots? Well, this is me and my buddy, Mike, again, and we're, we're doubled up in, in one of our favorite fishing spots. And that, that fishing spot came from uh, an, another member who said, hey, I fished this this lake. Um, you want to come fish with me? So that is join a fishing club, a, a kayak fishing club, because you'll find about these, you'll find you'll find spots that people will share with you. And this this is a particular lake that's electronic or electric motors only. So the power boats aren't on there. It's perfect for kayaks. There's very little, very little traffic. Um, Another way, another way is this, this, this comes up all the time is how are you going to find a spot? Or once you find a spot or you find a lake you're interested in, people will go to the DNR website and go to the lake finder part of it and look at surveys and look at the, the topographic information. So 
I probably don't go to a new lake without going to the lake finder spot here on, on, on the DNR website. I just want to see what's going on. Uh, Google Earth, there was a, a, a gentleman up in North Dakota that said, hey, come on up and fish with me. And I said, okay. I said, where are we going? He said, well, you'll see. And he took me down this dirt road and we got to the end and you could tell that something had been there. Well, there was a, there used to be an old boat launch there. So he found this dirt road that uh, hit this river and he called the sheriff and said, can I use that road? And he said, yeah, it's a public road. He said, there used to be a boat launch down there. He said, there isn't anymore, um, but you wouldn't be able to launch a boat from this. And he took me down this road and we fished this spot of the river and we didn't see anybody else all day long. So that was his tactic. He uses Google Earth, he'll find places and then he'll check out, you know, can this be used? Um, Non-motorized lakes, we talked about that. This is a non-motorized non lake. Uh, they are absolute favorites. I think there is a place where you can find a listing of non-motorized lakes where the power boats can only use their trolling motors. So those those are a lot of fun to get to because like I say, they're, they're, they're usually less pressured. Online, online lake report sites, there's fishity, there's, there's big, uh, there's, there's some big, online fishing stores that actually have lake reports. I almost file a lake report every time I go fishing. Um, that just gives me a history because I can go back into where I file mine and I have, here's what was working, here's what's working during this season, here's where I was fishing. It's got, it's got everything. So it, it, it's kind of fun. It, it's a way to share your information with others and also have a history. I, I keep all the lakes I fish on there. So this, to sum it up, for me, it's it's the get closer to the action. I mean, kayak fishing is a thrill. It really is. Get the fishing spots other can't, other boats can't because it's it's less pressured waters. So that's what I, that's what I have for you. If you have any questions, I I am totally available for anything. Um, and that's 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 our club, the Minnesota Kayak Fishing Association. This this is a shorter version of the uh, the web URL address, but tight lines, get out kayak fishing. Great presentation, Ron. Thank you so much for joining us today and and talking about this. I think it's probably one of the fastest growing sports in fishing right now, and and a lot of youth are getting out doing it, which is great. So. Um, Jason had, you were talking about kayaks and all these different, uh, types you can buy. And I was, I was just kayaking the crowing river here a few weeks ago on some rented ones that didn't have rod holders and stuff. And I can completely understand why you'd want to go try some of these out to look for rod holders, um, more comfortable seats and stuff like that. But Jason brought up something that you, or has a question about something you didn't address was the new, I guess, kind of new, um, thing of inflatable kayaks do you have any experience with those or yeah there's um there there's several members that that have inflatable kayaks there the, the upside for sure is where they really work out well is if you're an rver instead of having a big rack with two you know rigid kayaks 10 feet long and trying to haul it along with that they pack up into a bag that is about the size of a large suitcase so it, they're extremely popular with the RV crowd, you know, and RVs got popular uh, during COVID and, and the inflatable kayaks are very popular with the RV crowd. It's also very popular with people that have apartments or condos that don't have the space in their garage or any other place for them. And they are, there's the, the materials that they are made out of. They've, they've come a long, long way. I mean, people that hear the term inflatable kayak and they go, well, it's going to pop if I hit it into something. <laughs> that's, just, that's just not the case. I mean, there's there's um, several models. It's the same thing. They come in different lengths. They come in different widths. I mean, they have tandems. They have sing singles. Um, they're, they're, they, they have a specific niche that, that it's perfect for. So I would, same thing is, you know, if you're if if that's if that's you and that's what you're interested in, call the local fishing kayak dealers and say, "Hey, I'm interested in an inflatable. You know, can I go try them out?" And and they'll be more than happy to let you do that. 
No, I'm, I'm not real familiar with inflatable kayaks, but I know the paddle boards, uh, Jeff and I did a, a thing at the state fair last year on paddle boards, and they're amazingly hard, the inflatable paddle boards, uh, which is in, amazingly rigid. I thought that was pretty cool. I'm assuming the kayaks are kind of along the same line, and I'm just guessing they probably have attachment points and rod holders you can put on inflatable kayaks just like a regular plastic rotomobile kayak, right? Yeah, they do. As, as, and you talked about, we had kind of a situation where where do stand-up paddle boards um, fit into our club? And we pretty much said standard. standard. We, we broke it down to how does the manufacturer describe it? And we said that stand-up paddle boards are fine. There's, there's, there's a fine difference. There are several, they call them kayaks, but they're basically stand-up paddle boards that have kayak seats and other kayak features. So a lot of this stuff is, is kind of changing. So we were like, yes, your stand-up paddle boards are fine in our club and in our tournament. So um, there, there's, there's such a fine line between them. And, and there's, there's people that have stand-up paddle boards that they've decked out. I mean, everything we're talking about here, they, they put trolling motors on them, they put fish finders on them. And the, the stand-up paddle boards, companies know that you know they know they're going to be used for fishing so they've made them where they can be mounted there's a, a there's there's several manufacturers have it, it it's right between a stand up paddle board and a kayak i mean it, it's very low to the water it looks more like a stand up paddle board so there's a very the relationship between all those are they're they're very close and they kind of branch over and they they're 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 very similar in a lot of ways like I say, we Pretty. were we had to come to a decision: Are we going to allow stand-up paddle boards? And it was like, yes, because they're they're basically kayaks. Hey Benji, I, I just wanted to mention that I put a whole bunch of links in the chat, so if folks are looking for some of the resources connected to the things that uh, Ron was covering. Uh, we've got a lot of links there. So again, if that's not showing up on your screen and the, the ellipsis in the bottom, you can choose chat and get that. And then also um, love to have some more questions. So here's your chance to add some questions in the Q&A and uh, we can share those yeah. with Ron. And maybe Ron, you could stop sharing your, your PowerPoint and, and we can uh, see everybody more clearly. There we go. And thank you. And if it'll be, I did put the link to the Minnesota Kayak Fishing Association in the chat also. So if you do have follow-up questions after this, feel free to use that link and and send Ron a message through that. So um, Gary asked, um, not that you know specifically, but how do you how do I find a demo day in Southern Minnesota, the Mankato area possibly? I'm not familiar with any dealers down there that sell kayaks, but. Ask him, I, I can get get him several. I Okay. I, I, I did a search for um, uh, on the water demos and I didn't find any specific Google listing that would be that, but I, I know that um, it depends what you mean by Southern Minnesota. So he can, he can contact me if he wants. Do you have my email address in there? If he wants to contact me, I've, I know several dealers. I think that could probably help him. Okay. So Gary, we can uh, send you his email address or your emails on the website too, correct? Yeah, just, just go under the contact page and send me a uh, email. And I'll help them out. I know you brought up some really great points about safety in kayaking. And I, I just had this, my daughter's in, in band and one of her friends is diabetic. And they got one of those um, inflatable, like you were showing the inflatable things that have the Alka-Seltzer tab in there, specifically for that, if something, you know, low blood sugar or something like that happens and she falls out, she still has that jacket that's going to inflate, doesn't have to, be conscious to pull the ripcord on it. And I'm like, so is it great that you mentioned that? Cause I just, we just had this conversation last night about it. So, um, but there's kayaking Minnesota is there's a ton of rules and regulations around just boating in general. Um, I know in Minnesota, we do have to register watercraft that are 10 feet or over. So if you are using, and, and I put a link to some of these, from paddle camp in the chat too. So if you're interested in that, please search there in the chat function. But I didn't realize if you add a motor to your kayak that there's age restrictions on that all of a sudden. Because if you're, I think it's 13 years, if you're under 13 years of age, you either have to have an adult with you 
or you have to have a watercraft operator's permit. So having that electric motor in your kayak, if you have youth out there, that might be a decision factor for you getting into this too, so. Yeah, and I noticed that the language said, under 10 feet, you don't need a license as long as, as it's non-motorized. So if you're under 10 feet and at a motor, I assume you need to get a license for that also. So there is some impacts on that, making that choice. But it, great information, Ron. I just wanna share, I just got my first kayak this spring and uh, I, there are a lot of options, like you said, and I've had some trials with uh, sit-upons and then I actually had a, one that I tried at one time that was a paddling one, but this one is really basic. I only paid $300 for it on sale. It uh, is so stable and so comfortable. I mean, that is key. And this one does have a nice padded seat and pad, padded sides where your knees hit the side of the, the port. So it's, it's uh, and got a couple of rod holders and it's really all I need to be able to get out and access. We have a couple of smaller lakes that are connected just a half a mile across the lake that you can get into underneath the culvert and into some of these really great back lakes. It's been really fun. So if you've never tried it, I really encourage folks to get out and like you said, try one or find a friend who has one to borrow one for a day and check it out. And um, you'll be amazed, I think, at how quickly I grew up canoeing all the time. And uh, it's just, they're easy. They're so much easier to paddle and, and uh, quick and stable, more stable, I think, than a canoe. So it's, it's been awesome. Uh, Roxanne had a question she just threw in here. How do you keep the fish you catch while kayak fishing? A lot of people will just take a, a cooler and put it in the back there. It's um, it can be it can be a, a little bit of work if you put a string around there and you're you're dragging your your fish around with stringers. That that can be, it can be a little harder to steer. A lot of people put them in coolers. They'll just they'll just take a bag of ice and put a cooler in the back, just where my crate was. The same as where my crate was, and they'll put it in the back, back there. They they do actually make battery powered live wells that they're not very popular at all. I mean, you can use them for keeping bait, or you could keep fish in there, especially panfish if you were going to do that. But most people will just throw them into a cooler. Or if you look on the front hatch of like mine, some of the longer ones, they'll have a bin in there, and you could just throw ice in there and throw the fish in there. Or there are ma the manufacturers never fail to come up with stuff. They have fish bags that you can put up, you know. So most most of the time it'll be just a cooler in the back, you know. Let's just let's just put some ice in there and put them in the cooler. Yeah, that ice piece I think is really critical to keeping fish fresh. Um, you know, especially in the summertime. Obviously, the water temps get really warm and in uh, out in the sun. So you want to keep those fresh, and it's going to keep them tasty. I, I would say probably overwhelmingly, most people don't keep them. I mean, I, I, it's rare that I keep fish. I just catch them and throw them back. It's just, it's just easier. It's still a lot of fun, that's for sure. So, now let's see. Lindsay asked, Ron, do you know, do you know about what percentage of your club is women, or in general, have you seen any stats on that? I I could I could I, I will say this it, it it's growing. Um, there's there's an organization WAM Women Anglers of Minnesota, and we have a lot of people that are you know from there that are in our group, and I can name several. Um, I would say it, it's growing. That's that's what I would say. I I could go, go into our Facebook group and and find that, but it, it's it's definitely growing. I know Jeff. We look at these statistics all the time. Um, I know women in hunting and angling are some of the fastest growing numbers, but I'm not for sure if I've ever seen any statistics of, you know, 20% are women in this particular field. And so I don't know any of those off the top of my head either, but I know it is a, a growing uh, sport. So. Yeah, I would, you know, you, I would say, if I had to guess, I'd, I'd say it's between 10 and 15%, but I would say it's growing every year. Oh, you're on mute, Jeff. 
Someone's got to do that every week. <laughs> um, I uh, will put in the chat right now uh, our Becoming Outdoors Woman program. I think a lot of folks are familiar with that, but uh, certainly uh, fishing programs. And I know they've done some kayaking components uh, programs that have made, been made available through the Becoming Outdoors Woman. So it's a great resource, too. I'm frantically looking for Gary's uh, next question here because I just had it up and then I, I lost it. But um, he was asking, what is the cost and registration rules for kayaks uh, years for a license? Um, and it depends on, it looks like it depends on what you are. If you're just a, a regular person, you're not a nonprofit or something like that, kayaks and canoes, it looks like registration fee is $10.50. It says and they're good for good for three years. I saw that. And again, if it's under 10 feet and non-motorized, you do not need to register it. 10 feet and under. Great. So I encourage if you are getting into getting into kayaking or canoeing or anything on the water, go to the DNR website. I think we put a link to that in the chat. Look under what licenses and watercrafts, and there's a whole description there of, of what you need to do. Looks like it's ten dollars and fifty cents, and then there's a ten dollars and sixty cent invasive species surcharge on there. So, and you will get your your stickers and everything with that. So, uh, Roxana asked if you can take your kayak into the boundary waters. One of you wanted to answer that. <laughs> this this one this one comes up a lot. Um, Pedal pedal style kayaks definitely not. I mean, we 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 always tell people to go check with the um, the boundary waters people. It's it's it there there's very specific rules for. They don't want you to bring carts in because carts will rot up the trails. Um, they don't want you to do that. They don't they don't want pedal style kayaks in there at all. Um, there's very specific rules, so I would I would check with the. The, the people that, that what is it is it be the national park service the national park service um, there's specific rules and and we we usually just point them there and say ask them because they they know what it is because you you can take your paddle kayak in there from what i know but like i say you, you can't use the cart to transport it because you know they don't want the the trails rutted out it does depend on where you go because there are some portages that are handicap accessible. So I know I went in on Fall Lake this year and all the way into Pipestone are cart allowed portages. So you can go in there with the cart. Um, you know, the, I've been in the boundary waters of the kayak before, just a traditional paddle kayak, but the part that is hard is carrying it over the portage, right? They're not as easy to portage as a canoe is. So you need to be careful where you go. And the other thing a lot of people forget, and we talked about this in one of our ice fishing uh, webinars also, is you're not allowed to bring a battery-operated motor into, not only is gas not allowed, but battery-operated motors are not allowed in the boundary waters either. So, and I think that plays into the pedal power type thing. It's not, it has to be a traditional paddle sport, I believe, to get into the boundary waters. But yeah, maybe we can... Jeff, you want to look up a link for the Fish and Wildlife Service and or National Park Service, and I mean, there's probably a link for that in there, sure. in there too. So, good question. Gary says thanks, Ron and team, for a great show. I don't see any other questions in here. You had such a informative presentation. Our questions <laughs> are were probably answered already. So, and I think, and we are winding, winding down on time here also. So. I want to thank everybody for for joining us today and especially Ron for all your your great information. This is a, a fun sport to get into. It's an up and coming sport. Um, I did put a link in the chat on all the public water accesses across Minnesota from our DNR page. And I've said it on the program before and I will say it again. I think Minnesota ranks up there in the tops anywhere in the country for public water access that we have. Um, get out there, take advantage of it. It's a short summer season. I can't believe it's August already. So get out there and do everything you can to soak up the last bit of 
of summertime we have. So, and be safe out there. So, hey, Thanks everybody. I, I'm sorry. I did find out that uh, I was wrong. It's not National Park Service, it's uh, Forest Service through the U.S. Department of Agriculture. So, um, I should have known that, but I'm pasting that in the chat right now, one of the links for that the recreation areas up that include the boundary waters. And then um, next week, uh, we have joining us. Um, uh, Amy Schrank from the University of Minnesota Extension about cattails. I know there's a lot of conversations, people that have lake property or own uh, wetland areas and, and some of the issues around cattails, especially invasive cattails. So that'll be a really interesting talk. And then coming up the week after we have our deer season update. So a lot of things happening with deer hunting in Minnesota it happened during the legislature and some changes. So um, join us with one of our big AIM expert, Todd Frober, to talk about all the big changes in the deer season this fall. So there'll be some great opportunities to learn more. So folks can sign up for those by going to uh, DNR, mndnr.gov slash outdoors. Discover. 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 Yep. <laughs> thank you. So, thanks everybody, Ron. Thank you again so much for joining us and offering to do this. We really appreciate it. So you're welcome. Everybody stay safe. Enjoy the lovely weekend out there and hopefully we'll see you out in the water. <laughs>